So the title of my presentation this morning or afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in, is Strategies to Improve Ethical and Responsible Digital Health Research. And I'm Camille Nebaker. I'm an associate professor in the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity Science at UC San Diego. I'm also the director and co-founder of Recode Health, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a second. And I also serve as the director of the UC San Diego Research Ethics Program at UC San Diego, where we provide education, consultation, and conduct research with a focus on shaping ethical practices in the research arena. Um, I mentioned Recode Health. This is the Research Center for Optimal Digital Ethics and Health. And our group is responsible for conducting research that shapes responsible and ethical research practices in the field of artificial intelligence and digital health research. Um, this isn't something that we do by ourselves. We've, we've had a growing community of colleagues across the country, globe, who have been contributing to the research that we do. We've been in existence since, um, the center's been in existence since 2018 and was launched with funding from UC San Diego after realizing how important it was to get ahead of what we needed to be thinking in terms of the ethical, legal, and, and societal implications of the use of artificial intelligence and digital tools in health research. This doesn't even come close to showing all of the people that have been involved, but I put this slide up because it's really important that, that we recognize that in this arena of digital health and artificial intelligence, there's a lot of different sectors involved. And so we have been working with industry, with not non-government organizations, with um, federally fund or federal funding um, agencies, as well as engaging with students and, and trainees from many different disciplines. And so this is a, definitely a very multi-interdisciplinary team that we work with. And mentioning that, you know, with this, the work that we're doing, we're not only working with researchers, however, that's really where we got our start is working with colleagues in behavioral medicine who wanted to use different kinds of technologies to better understand how people behaved and, and functioned in the wild trying to figure out, and this was a, a precursor to precision medicine, where how do you know how people are behaving in real time? Up until 10 years ago, we basically could only rely on self-report. And that oftentimes was based on recall, sometimes, you know, having to remember what somebody did two weeks, you know, in the past. So with the use of, of, uh, wearable sensors, we could start to look at what people were doing in real time 24 seven. So we started because researchers had an interest in using these tools and didn't want to make mistakes. And so I was asked to provide consultation to behavioral scientists at UC San Diego who were curious about handling the data correctly, what kinds of privacy um, precautions might we need to think about. And so we we did start off to work with researchers, but then because of the role that researchers have within academic institutions and the processes for getting approval to conduct research, we started working closely with um, institutional review boards and also with um, eth ethics and legal scholars who were thinking, starting to think deeply about issues of privacy and data management, um, which led us to working more with people who were creating the technologies and who and how were they thinking about downstream social implications when they were creating a technology that would be used to capture data in real time and then transport that data um, through um, a mobile app or some other kind of transmission system. Everything was changing, and this was, again, about a decade ago that we started thinking about how do we support this movement from very traditional methods of conducting research to um, approaches that involved a lot of different types of technologies. 
So at Recode Health, um, we focus on, on capacity building. That's our building research integrity and capacity program. So that's really a, an area of education. This webinar is part of, of what our BRIC offerings are. Is be, we really want to reach people and help them to understand through education how to think through some of the ethical, legal, and social implications of, of the work that they're doing as they do their research. We developed the core platform, which is connected in open research ethics to bring this community together and provide a venue for where researchers, IRB members, ethicists, developers could talk to one another and have conversations so that they could um, hopefully avoid mistakes. And so by creating this community, we have done that in response to the requests of researchers, of developers, because, you know, when you're, when you're in an early phase of a new form of research, you don't want to make mistakes. And, and what we're trying to do is create the community where we can share what we've learned that has worked well, but also share what we thought would work well that didn't work so well. And so this is um, the core platform was initiated with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that we received back in 2015. And one of the reasons they gave us the funding is that they said never before had they granted so many, so much, um, so many proposals, had funded so many proposals that focused on digital methods to collect data from research participants. But in nearly every one of those cases, the the delay that was caused by trying to get an IRB approval was setting them back anywhere from nine months to a year. And so when they learned about our interests in trying to bridge this gap between the researchers who were wanting to use these new tools and the IRBs that were um, vetting that research before it could be approved and implemented, they were really interested in helping us get um, this community set up. And so the core platform was inspired really from researchers, but we did a lot of participatory design work to create what the functionality is of the core platform. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that toward the end of my presentation. And the other thing that we've really spent a lot of time on is creating um, decision support tools and sharing what we're learning with researchers through our publications so that we collectively and as a community are shaping ethical best practices in digital and mobile health. So the objectives of my talk today are to really focus on what the unique ethical, legal, regulatory, and social implications are that may arise during the study design and IRB review of a study, to introduce to you a digital decisions, uh, decision support framework that we have developed through an iterative participatory process that helps researchers think through what the privacy dimensions are, risks and benefits, data management, and what to consider with respect to access, usability, and acceptability. And then focusing again back on the roles of the stakeholders in this, in this ecosystem, thinking through how do we as a community um, vested in the interests of doing this well, work together and across disciplines to um, make this work well. So I have used this term, ethical, legal, and social implications. Its acronym is ELSI. It has its origins in the genetic research where when the funding was created to do genetic research, there was a, there was a five to 10% of that budget earmarked for conducting research to examine the ethical, legal, and social implications of doing genetic research. And I adopted that acronym and have used it to really think about what it is we're doing with respect to digital health research. And so when I talk about ethics, I'm talking about the principles that we use in research ethics, particularly, particularly those that we use with um, human subjects research. So we're thinking about respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. And those are the principles that come from the Belmont Report. And they map to how we conduct informed consent, 
How do we respect the rights of people who may not be subjects of the study, but who may be in proximity to a person who could be recorded by a device that's being worn by the research participant? We think about beneficence in terms of risk and benefit evaluation, thinking through what are the risks, can they be mitigated, are they reasonable in, in relation to potential benefits that may be realized from the study. And then we're looking at the principle of justice and whether or not the, the study is designed in a way that's inclusive, that will be designed in a way that benefits those who are likely to um, really struggle with whatever the health concern is under study. And so making sure that if a study is designed using these digital technologies that the people who are enrolled in the study can actually use and access and, and be a participant because, and not have barriers. So with legal implications, these are legal and regulatory. These are um, the regulations for human research protections, privacy regulations like the um, California privacy regulation, as well as the general data privacy regulation that is um, in the European Union. We have intellectual property laws. We have conflicts of interest laws. Those are things that um, are dealt with by different bodies. If you're with an academic institution, those would be your institutional review board, your privacy office, your um, uh, conflict of interest committees, um, commercialization offices. So these are all different bodies that get involved in, in vetting the research that's going to be conducted or managing it after some kind of intellectual property has been developed. And then we think about the social implications. And these are you know, what happens downstream? What are the potential things that we don't know to think about up, up front? How do we return value back to people who might be participants in these studies? Because the studies that involve digital technologies are designed in a very different way where the, the return of information may be something that you're doing in real time every day as part of the intervention. The idea that you would return information back to an individual about what you're learning in real time is very, um, it, it's, it's not traditional. And so we have to, as ethicists, think about how do you give information back to somebody? Is it potentially harmful? Is it potentially, um, how do you make it culturally appropriate? And what do we want people to learn from the data that we're collecting? Um, so there's a lot of different implications for thinking about what could happen downstream. And then privacy expectations are another example, and those can vary considerably across demographics and, and generations. So just you know, to anchor the conversation, I, I wanted to give you a little bit of a foundation of what I'm talking about when I use these terms. And just um, a snapshot of what we're thinking about when we're talking about digital health. This is just an example of the variety of data that we have ac accessible to us now that we can make inferences about a person, an individual, a group, a community's health. And so, you know, what one area is the electronic health record that has been mined for over 30 years now. And it's um, the go-to tool for a lot of artificial intelligent applications. Can we use these kind of data to make good decisions? Are they accurate? Are they making predictions that are relevant? Um, those are all things that are under study right now. What can we learn from the environment, from remote place sensors, from air pollution, from transportation? Um, the thing that we can identify from social media now, how can we mine data? How can we mine conversations, watch behaviors? And, and even with respect to the pandemic, so much was learned about the, the spread of the pandemic based on tweets. So these are all very interesting, new, and, and potentially valuable resources for, for studying human health but they have, you know, both, they all have limitations. Um, when I first got involved in digital health research, it was, you know, using apps on a telephone. That's a pretty common way of studying people's behaviors. The ecological momentary assessment 
um, strategy has been around for a very long time where you can deploy surveys on a person's smartphone, have them answer a few questions as questions are, are returned in real time. And so you can get, you know, immediate responses to how somebody is doing or whether they have done something as, as rapidly as you can deploy these, these surveys, which can be done randomly, they can be done on a schedule. Um, but that's, and then there's um, this sense cam was also one of the first tools that I was introduced to where the researchers were studying how people live in the wild and they used the camera to, they had the, the research participant wear the camera so that the camera would take a, an image every seven seconds about what that person's first person point of view was. So it could tell you whether they were eating, exercising, transporting. I, so everything that was right in front of that person could be recorded. And this is the uh, really one of the initial barriers to doing this kind of work was the IRB's response to the use of a camera because it would capture people who were not research participants. And so Whereas I could agree to participate in a study and sign a consent form and wear this device, it didn't um, consider that people in my workspace or in the grocery store or at the park or in my office would want to be imaged without consent. But in reality, when you're doing research with human subjects, you the bystander is not a person of interest. And so unless the research question is specifically about what the research participant is seeing, that person, that bystander would not be considered a research participant and would not therefore need to provide informed consent. So these were um, new ethical dilemmas and in some cases, regulatory dilemmas because the, the regulations don't cover bystanders. And there were questions about whether they should be covered. This is a sensor that was um, developed by Todd Coleman, who is now at Stanford. He had been at, at UC San Diego, um, where he could create these sensors that were um, charged through, um, they, they could be charged through sunlight. They could gather information about a participant's temperature, you can see all of the different um, types of data that could be collected. And then this is transmitted through an app on a, on a participant's telephone. And the kinds of sensors that are picking up different kinds of data, you can see the camera here. This is a, a GPS and um, um, accelerometer. And, you know, picking up these signals, sending the signal to the phone, which could then be um, deployed to the researcher, and then also social media um, data. And so all of these types of data collection tools are collecting images, physical location, um, activity level, and then social networks. So again, new types of research methods, we have new kinds of data that we need to be mindful of and think through how are those data going to be stored. At the same time that this academic research landscape is really moving into a digital um, uh, approach, we're seeing a lot of the health tech companies that do not have the same regulations as academic research centers getting involved in producing and providing services to people. And so a lot of these uh, products that are on the market are making claims that they can do certain things, but many of them don't have research to support the claims. And so, you know, as we're thinking about um, the landscape and increasingly uneven regulatory applications. I think it's just Im important for all of us to be aware that that it is um, inconsistent and that inconsistency can actually lead to, um, I guess public concern would be one area that it could be a potential risk for all of us that are in the digital health space. And so this was a, an article that came out last week that I was interviewed for asking about whether or not the use of chat GPT 
um, as a tool to support a mental health program, it was appropriate. And so in this, in this article and in this study that was done, they enrolled 4,000 people who were using the service um, where they anticipated they were speaking with real people, but the messaging, the messaging was being um, augmented by a, a chat bot. And so there's been a lot of question about whether that's appropriate. And this brings up a, a conundrum because as I mentioned, you know, organizations that accept federal funding to conduct research only are able to get that funding if they have agreed to um, apply regulations to the research. And so when you're in an industry where you're not supported by federal dollars, you don't have those same requirements. And in this case, this experiment was done and there were no um, requirements for an institutional review board to review the study, which in, meant also that there was no requirement for people who were um, involved as participants in the study to provide informed consent. And so a lot of conversations of late have been around whether or not they should have the opportunity to consent and is this a, you know, what kind of, how do you evaluate the risk when you're testing um, a chat bot, which many of us have used to make car, re, you know, reservations to get our car fixed or, you know, to pick up a prescription. Those are the kinds of things that we're using in our everyday life. But when it comes to applying those technologies to some, someone who's in need of mental health services, it's um, probably an experiment that you would want others to be involved with vetting in advance of its deployment. So some of the challenges and opportunities that we're experiencing in this area, um, I've mentioned, but you know, when we think about how can machine learning and artificial intelligence support better healthcare, the questions are around, can it make a clinician more efficient and effective? Can it replace um, someone who is in the healthcare system, at what point might that happen? Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to evaluate the benefits, the risks, and the impact on, on the workforce. Um, we're also really interested in looking at, at governance in terms of whether or not our ex existing systems, as I was mentioning, you know, we have the federal regulations for academic institutions or organizations that receive federal support that have been in place for a very long time. So the existing systems we need to evaluate, are they still current? Are they responsive? Are they relevant? Um, but then we also have to look at where they are not, um, where they're, they just don't exist. And they don't exist in, in many cases because they haven't needed to. But I, I'd say over the past decade, it's really increased the number of non-covered um, or organizations that are not bound by the federal regulations that are doing research with human subjects. It really does require that we pause and think about, do we wait for a regulation or do we come up with some other standards that, that organizations can adhere to? We think about data management, which is a really, really broad area because it, it covers data collection, data storage, data sharing, um, data return. And so when we think about um, how granular the data are now and how easy it is to identify who that individual might be, how do we or do we promise ever data anonymity? And then if if we can de-identify, how robust is that de-identification process? So all of these things are, are really important to consider because it does impact whether or not a person can choose to participate in a study and what do they need to know in order to be informed and, and the level of technology literacy, research literacy, data literacy that is needed in order to truly be able to join a study as a volunteer. And so one of the things my colleagues and I started working on, and this was back in 2016, 2017, was trying to figure out how do we help researchers make decisions when they're designing their studies? 
And um, we started doing this by looking at a framework that the American Psychiatric Association had started to develop because the physicians that were working with patients we're sometimes making recommendations for a patient to use a, a product like one of the ones you saw on that prior screen to help with um, just meditation, mindfulness, um, and realize that within those apps that may not have been tested or found to be successful in doing what they claim to do, they had terms and conditions of use that were potentially dangerous to the person who would download the app and activate it. So the American Psychiatric Association was concerned that they might be doing harm and started to develop a framework that could be used by um, psychiatrists. And when we looked at that framework, we, we weren't quite certain it would be useful to researchers. And so we started this process of interviewing people who were stakeholders, whether they be clinicians or regulatory people, legal scholars, ethicists, um, people that, that were involved in this um, area. We interviewed, we did focus groups, we built a checklist, we tested a checklist, we iterated on that checklist. And it, over several phases, we developed this framework, which has access and usability, data management, risks and benefits, privacy as the four core domains. And they're grounded in the ethical principles that um, map to the Belmont report and to the Menlo report. And so these um, are just examples of what items are in our checklist. Now, when we think about respect for persons in, um, as a principle, it's practiced through the informed consent process. And so the way this checklist works is if you're thinking about how do I design my consent form, it would map to, are you making your consent form accessible to diverse populations? Do you explain whether it's um, been tested for short and long-term feasibility? Do you tell people about what kind of personal data are collected and where it's stored? So these are just areas that we want to make sure a researcher knows would be important to integrate into a consent form. And when we think about beneficence, justice, and respect for law and public interest, we're thinking more about what do you put into your research protocol? So you can use this um, framework and the checklist items to both help to design a research protocol as well as the consent communications. And so this is an example of what the domain of access and usability looks like. So we explain what it is. It's really about whether or not the product is designed for the end user that will be in the study. Um, thinking about how does it work? How is that communication or information communicated? Has it been tested with the target population and found to be usable? Or do they need additional tools to be able to use or participate? And then you can see here um, with more detail about how the, um, the, the checklist items are organized based on the ethical principles. And here you'll see contract provides. So this is an example that I used with a digital health company that wanted to have their product put into the workflows of a healthcare system. And so we were talking about what kind of terms do you need to see in this contract? It could easily be changed to what does the consent provide? And so this is, again, under respect for persons, thinking about how do you communicate what you need to communicate with the rest of these items under justice and um, beneficence being really much more specific to the protocol. Um, again, privacy, we're thinking about personal information collected, expectations of the patient and uh, participant. Um, what needs to be secured, what can be shared, making sure if there's any control that the end user has, that that's explained. Um, and all of these overlap. I mean, so risk and benefits are going to intersect with data management and they're going to intersect with privacy. They will intersect with access and usability. Um, so these are just areas that I think we really need to be cognizant of. And with 
with respect to risk, we're thinking about what are what is the type of harm? And when we talk about type, it's psychological, physical, emotional, reputational. Is it severe? How long will it last? And how intense is this potential harm? And, you know, so questions about AI accountability and transparency are, are very important when we're thinking through, does the product, has, has the harm been thought through ahead of time? And, you know, with the different types of technologies, it's really important. Same with, with chat GPT has the potential for harm, which all, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot about the potential for harm, but there also are a lot of conversations about the potential benefits, but we want to make sure that those are built into the programming so that having a lot of diversity at the table when these things are being designed is how we avoid that downstream harm. And data management, again, you know, what is it, what's collected, what is shared, what is stored. Um, and then those, that was really, you know, a very important tool that we built and we continue to iterate on it. We're doing, in addition to the work that we've done to support decision-making, we're really thinking deeply about how we return information back to people and whether or not that information is accessible, can they do anything with it? Um, is it of value to them? And I think as people are enrolling in long-term studies, this conversation with return of information started when I was helping to set up the All of Us Research Program and was involved with just helping to plan the protocol and the consent communications. And a commitment was, you know, to, to return information that they were learning about research participants. And so the conversation was, well, what do people want and when do they want it? How often do they want it? In what form do they want it? And that can vary across people because people may want and desire different levels of information. And at the kind of pretty concurrent with that, um, those conversations at that point in time, and this was back in 2016, 17, we were doing some research with older adults and wanted to know what would motivate them to stay in a study for five years. It was an observational study. We wanted to learn how healthy people age over time and what contributes to healthy aging. And one of the things that they mentioned to us is that they really wanted to know what we were learning about them. And they said, you know, if you learn something about me as an individual, and you can tell me maybe how I'm changing over time, I would want to know that. But I'd also want to know what are you learning about us as a group? And how do you share information so that we know what you're learning? So learning was a very big motivator for people to stay in the study. And so what we did was we took a paper that we had published about them, and it was in a peer-reviewed journal that was then later um, re- purposed for a Forbes article. Um, and so we took the Forbes article, we took our peer reviewed manuscript, and we took a press release, all talking about the same study. And we shared it with people who are participating in this longitudinal study and asked them, what kind, how, how could we return this kind of information back to them? And they didn't want to read the manuscript. And so just because a manuscript's been written, and maybe even it's open access, it doesn't it's not accessible to people who may not have the education or the training to read peer reviewed papers. And so what they were telling us is that we really want to know, but we want to hear it and, and have access to it in a very different way. And so we prototyped different types of infographic um, delivery to find out from them what would be most desirable. And this process of working with participants is very much a part of our approach. And whether the participants are people who might be in studies, or they are researchers who are doing this kind of work, or IRB members, we're always wanting to um, partner with the people who we think have the insights that we need to develop what we are hoping to deliver. Now, um, a couple of our studies are very much focused on informed consent. And 
we're trying to figure out how to make that process more accessible and meaningful to people who may choose to be in a study that has digital technologies or the use of artificial intelligence or machine learning. So those of you who have um, agreed to anything uh, typically have been exposed to terms and conditions of use. And this is a little cartoon that I think is pretty indicative of what I think most of us would think of when we open up a terms of service and think, how quickly can I get to the checkbox that just says I agree so I don't have to go through this maze of, of language. But our informed consent documents don't look that much different than a terms and conditions of use. And in fact, over the years, they've come to look a whole lot more like a terms and conditions of use. And, and my colleagues at Recode Health have laid out what a consent form looks like and just says, like here in this page somewhere, they're telling us who is conducting the study and why is the study being done? So, you know, each one of these pages will tell us something that we need to know in order to be able to volunteer to participate. But we think it could look very different. And um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Brian McGinnis has been applying the service design approach with um, during design workshops with people who represent those who might be in the study that we're designing for to find out whether or not the way that we're used to communicating, what could it look like if it was designed to be accessible and meaningful and promote learning about a study that would allow for somebody to truly volunteer to participate. And, and Brian has written some papers with other colleagues in our group that, that should be out soon. Um, but they've been using this process called affinity diagramming, where they take a lot of what they're learning. This is an, a qualitative research approach, but just a, a very different way of laying out the information and visualizing the information. And then they synthesize it. And, and this is as um, soon as our paper comes out, you'll all be the first to see it. Um, the process towards meaningful consent, this is just another example coming from the older adult community that we worked with, where they took these consent forms, again, IRB approved consent documents and made, we, what we asked them is like, what would this look like if it was designed for you? And this was the prototype that one of my students created based on what we heard from them. Like they didn't want to see it like this. They wanted to see a table of contents. They wanted to click on a button to, you know, to go straight to what, um, how much time is involved? What are the possible risks? And when they got to that section, they wanted to be able to make the, the visualization larger. They wanted to be able to turn it so they didn't have to read it, but they could hear it. Um, they wanted to be able to see what this looked like by clicking on a video. And so these features that we learned about, um, I think it's really important to as for those of you who are researchers, it's really important for you to know that making consent accessible to people who might participate in your study is an ethical responsibility that you have. And one of the things that I think I'm going to be pushing back on quite a bit over the next year or two is we need to move away from these um, compliant versions of informed consent that the IRBs like to have us use because they're not accessible to most people. In fact, these, when we sent them through our readability software, came out to graduate level reading. Um, so this is not the direction we're trying. We, we want to move away from this. And I would encourage all of you to really think about what you want to do when you want to engage with your prospective participants and not jump through the hoop that the IRB tells you you must do. Um, and if you have any questions about that, I'd love to talk more about that. I, I want to also say that um, thinking about how to communicate digital health to people can happen beyond research. Um, I was part of the CA Notify exposure notification development team. And how do you get 40 million people to adopt a technology that will help us reduce um, the spread of COVID? And so in order to learn about whether or not people would activate um, 
this app on their phone was we only did this by talking to a lot of Californians and and doing focus groups and showing them images and showing them text and this process of engaging with people who you want to work with. I, I don't think it can be understated. Um, and again, when we were doing the CA Notify, I, I can tell you that every single one of these stakeholders was in the room at, talking with each other. And so the technology creators, um, one of the big findings that came out of one of our, our group discussions that um, our colleague Daniela Vital conducted these focus groups in an area of San Diego that is primarily Latino. And one of the big takeaways from this focus group that she conducted was that Bluetooth wasn't understood by the community. They thought it was threatening. This was the safest way that, that Google and Apple thought they could protect uh, privacy. And so they chose to use the Bluetooth technology, but the people, um, those that we spoke to were untrusting of Bluetooth and they didn't know how it worked. So we were able to take this, this learning back to our group meeting, which involved the technology creators. And we could say, you know, we need a way to explain this to people. Can you help us explain how this works, why you chose it, why it's a safer option? And then we could retool what they were telling us and test it with the people that we wanted to um, share that information with. And I think this is just, you know, talking amongst each other because we each have responsibilities in this new ecosystem and outsourcing or thinking that, you know, once you get the IRB approval, that's all you need to do. I think we really need to be um, going one step further and thinking beyond the box here. And, and that leads me now to just wanting, one of our studies is, is funded to help us understand what are the potential risks of harm when using digital technologies in health research. And I've been on IRBs for many years and I've, I've stopped doing that as of about four years ago because I, I didn't see the evidence that I needed to see in terms of risk assessment. And so a lot of a lot of, um, and I'm, you know, I, I think of IRB members as partners and collaborators and helpers. And at this point, we, you know, we're expecting IRB members to have the technology literacy, the data literacy that is, may, may not be part of their um, expertise. So, so determining what is a harm is very, very difficult when you don't understand the technology or the types of data produced or where the data are going. So we have funding to start to understand better what is a risk and how do we qualify and quantify that. And we're recruiting researchers and IRB members to help us do this work. And I would love to have any and all of you who are interested in participating. Um, scan the QR code or reach out to our team to let us know if you would like to participate. Um, in closing, I just want to um, say again that the Recode Health Center is focusing on all parts of our of our ecosystem, again, the stakeholders, and providing consultation, education, and resources and tools um, for this community to use. I mentioned the core platform when I first started speaking. This was a result of our Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funding, and it was designed based on what the community said they needed, and we built it, and it involves sharing of resources, things that you have developed that work, things that you have um, questions about, you can ask through our, our forum. We had... Um, We've rebuilt this over the past couple of years, and so it's now about to be relaunched. But at the time where we um, started the rebuild, we had about 2,000 global network members. And so this community is here to help one another. And I would encourage you all to reach out and let us know how you would like to be involved as we move forward. And with that, um, my contact information and information about our center and 
I think I can stop sharing now, Lindsay. Should I just um, yep. turn it over to you? And we'll, yep, we'll just open it up for any questions. If you want to raise your hand, you can, and then you can ask your question directly to Dr. Nebecker. No do, we, do, do we have any questions? <laughs> Take a minute to formulate. Uh, I know you, uh, uh, Camille. Uh, this was so nice of you to do this for for the MDOT Center. Uh, again, we at MDOT Center have been a fan of your work. <laughs> And so uh, we, we have we have greatly enjoyed this opportunity. I wanted to ask your thoughts on one issue that we have been struggling with, uh, which is that the the AI world moves very rapidly. Uh, so people, uh, researchers in the AI community, or like wearable AI community, uh, their whole career is about finding new uh, information that can be automatically or passively inferred from the same sensor that people either carry in their smartphone or wear in the smart watches. And so that, I mean, so the risks uh, with respect to what health or state or behaviors can potentially be inferred from the same sensors that people carry or wear has been rapidly increasing, expanding. And so the IRB protocols that describe the risks in the informed consent, uh, they lag behind mm -hmm. uh, because of that. What approach or uh, what do you see as, uh, as a solution to close that gap between when new vulnerabilities or privacy risks become known to where, I mean, when they become widespread uh, in terms of the IRB protocols, incorporating them, which then can reach to the to the participants who participate in those studies. You're raising such an important question, and I and I guess I wonder what you would think of redesigning the IRB process, like if it were to be redesigned so that it's more dynamic and more um, real time. So maybe it is more like um, uh, Stack Overflow. You know, so how do we get our participants in the loop so that there's not an IRB here, a researcher here and a participant over here, but they're all in the loop and researcher says, gosh, we didn't anticipate this, but this is something that we want you to know about. Now that participant is going to get pinged and they can choose, like, get me out of here. I, this is not for me anymore. But if the IRB is the bottleneck that's keeping me from knowing what you know, and I'm a participant and I may not want to be that participant anymore, how do we redesign the system and that's one of the things that we were pondering when we created the Connected and Open Research Ethics platform. We said, this community can self-monitor. This community is here to keep us doing things better. And we have to trust each other. But if we have to outsource to an IRB that doesn't understand it, they're actually causing harm. So what would your design be? Because this is a design question. Uh, uh, so uh, you you are you you know about this a lot more than I do, but I I can only point I mean uh, envision issues or problems with some of the designs. So dynamic notification or dynamic consent uh, has a lot of problems too because the uh, many research may already have been done. There are lots of open data sets. That means they have been shared or I mean, so reducing or recalling may not be possible. And then uh, how frequently should the participants receive that ping? Let's say even in the All of Us program, right? Where they're participating and uh, for a longer period, how frequently do I really want to hear about the study that I participated in four years ago when we didn't know about all this? 
So, 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 so um, there, there are issues with respect to what is the right design and what is the, I mean, so that though, I mean, uh, people do get the, their volition respected whether they want to be pinged or not pinged, whether they want to hear about it, not hear about, and then they, I mean, what options do they want to exercise or not exercise? There is option overload, there is notification overload, right? There is choice overload. So, uh, and, be, and the uh, is most scarce commodity in people's life is time and their attention. Yeah, and I get, you know, and, and you're right. And I think what it comes down to is what is the potential for harm? And if if the likelihood of you or anyone knowing something about me that I may not know that you can know leads to me being discriminated against or stigmatized, if we can prevent that outcome, then I think that's that's a different way of approaching risk management. So rather than individual level consent, which is impossible to manage, how do we just prevent that harm from being realized? Because isn't the harm truly discrimination, stigmatization, and potentially loss of services that they may have had access to had somebody not known that, that they were predisposed to have X, Y, and Z, or their behaviors in their everyday life are going to, you know, show up in three years as X disease? Yeah, the, I mean, in terms of potential uh, I mean, harm, there are numerous, I mean, uh, of course, uh, because uh, if somebody participated in a study, it represents their life at that point in time. And their life uh, today uh, may not be the same. But the information that is now revealed is about their life at that time, mm -hmm. and so uh, should the should uh, should that be used against them, or uh, in any form or fashion, whether it's their employer, whether it's insurance company, whether it's their family friends, whether it's media, it's 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 it needs a careful thinking by experts like you. <laughs> Me and many, like yeah, yeah. you can't, you and the expertise that you bring, I can't know what you know without you being there, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, several, I, I've recently been working with people across the Bridge to AI Consortium. And I think that that is a, a model that's bringing together the diversity of expertise that's needed to start unpacking really complex problems. But again, what I did four years ago, if that risk of harm was to confront me today when I maybe did everything that I needed to do to be become a healthier person, right? It, it's like, um, we really need to really think through how to avoid those future harms and, and those social implications that could really be damaging to people who are participating in good faith, you know, and trying to do, uh, contribute to, to knowledge. Yeah, I have one more question, but I should uh, wait and see if other people have questions. Okay, so not seeing anybody take the floor. Uh, Shaheen, so you, you have, I'm glad you raised your hand. Oh, yes. I just uh, wanted to ask briefly, just uh, I would love to know more about your, your experiences, Camille, with uh, IRBs and different institutional review boards. And over the years, we've seen such a diversity in experience with mobile health, with wearable AI, with even the, you know, the, the types, the sensing technologies that are available within a smartwatch, whether commercially available or, or, or otherwise. It's just the, that diversity of experience and experiences has yielded such a different um, slate of review processes. In one situation, they're very familiar and you see a lot of comfort, a lot of expertise in other situations. Rightfully so. I think they want to protect the rights and welfare of research participants. Things move much more slowly because they just don't know. And I know that you must, you, you touched on that in the presentation. I'd just love to hear more about that experience and maybe even, dare I say, what has helped some of these IRBs in our current climate. Because we know they're not there yet in terms of kind of what you had just talked about. What has helped them move the needle to be more aware of risks, being able to evaluate risk versus risks and benefits, 
just that whole milieu of, of, of issues with this cutting edge technology. Well, that truly is why I got involved in this back in 2013, because my colleague had NIH grants ready to, to deploy and she couldn't get IRB approval. And it took eight to nine months for her to get the approval. And even within our own institution, where we have six IRBs, each one of those IRBs, when reviewing identical protocols, came up with different ideas about risk, risk management, whether the study should move forward. And it was, um, and that prompted me to contact the Office of Human Research Protections the federal office. And I said, you know, what are you all thinking, doing about this? And they said, well, you know, we have about 6,000 IRBs across the country and they're all going to have their own ideas about what to do and what circumstances. And, and it was just, you know, there are institutions that are doing more of this work that are taking the time to try to get that expertise. I just don't think the IRB model is the model for this movement of rapid research. And you know how, and maybe in California, we have this embryonic stem cell research committee. It's called an escrow committee. I don't think it exists anymore. We just have stem cell uh, research committees, but we have a special body of people that review only that kind of research. And I think what we're expecting of IRBs is just way too much for what they're um, capable of thinking and doing. One of the people that, and this was five years ago when I was um, serving on the I IRB, he um, he didn't have a smartphone. He didn't have, a, I mean, it was a flip phone. So like when we were talking about doing certain things on a phone, it just didn't make sense. Like didn't, he didn't have that lived experience. So we're hoping that people have some lived experience, some technology experience, but I just think we need a different model. And that's not to uh, say anything poorly about the IRB. We're asking too much of them. And I, I, I've seen a couple institutions doing things, but we also did a review of all the institutions that had gotten funding from the NIH to do certain types of mobile health research. We then looked at their IRBs to see what kind of guidance they were providing, visible guidance on their websites, and it, there was nothing. I mean, so I think we're really, they don't have the capacity to keep up. Mm -hmm. And I see a question in the chat. You talk a little bit about the role of funding agencies in this dynamic. Ramona, tell me more. Oh, hi. Thank you. I'm thinking um, about the fact that there are funding agencies that drive uh, sometimes in very particular detail the research design process and uh, the consenting process. and. So it seems like they have a role that it's often not necessarily very prominent uh, in discussion, but uh, very prominent in the background. So thanks for that question. I think that when we think about the, the ecosystem, we, we think about like um, the institutional review board may be at the institutional level, but there are federal guidelines that are driving how that IRB operates. When it comes to federal agencies that fund the research, they also have a really important role in shaping how we do our, our work. And so if the federal agencies said, build in time to work with the people who you're designing this for, build in time to you know, implement the education that's needed to build capacity. Instead, they they have funding that has um, moved this faster, but don't build the infrastructure. And I think where the funding agencies could really help is requiring certain type of expertise to be on these um, proposals and also building in time for that infrastructure because our consent, as you know, um, and for all, Ramona works with us on Recode Health. The every stakeholder has a role to play here, and and every stakeholder can have a role in shaping better practices that are more relevant instead of trying to drag forward obsolete um, strategies that are not working for us any longer. <laughs>